I would like, uh, first of all, to say that I'm very pleased to see so many people gathered together in this room with this uh, common spirit, because I uh, actually landed in the uh, Centre Pompidou four years ago, and um, I decided to carry out some archaeologic work or historic work. I wanted to try to understand preci precisely what uh, the purpose of this uh, building was. And I was a bit struck by one element, because I think this also corresponded to my own sensitivity. Um, George Pompidou uh, at the time so, uh, said that we uh, were able to uh, really keep our heritage, but certainly not support innovation or creativity. And then in the 1970s, many people believed also in the fact that we uh, could, um, uh, how do I put it, um, put an end to frontiers, to borders, to limits, and so on, and uh, work in a more transdisciplinary uh, way. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's also a very powerful challenge because we really need to uh, transcend those uh, disciplines, photography, uh, arts, and so on. Uh, but also, and this is uh, quite important, to um, try to put together reason and emotions. And uh, three years ago, we uh, decided to start this uh, cycle called Mutation Creation because we wanted to organize exhibitions and try to see how we can uh, build a bridge between science and technology. So we had, of course, uh, Generating the Living, and I hope that you have the uh, possibility to visit that exhibition. So that's the last production in this cycle. And as far as I'm concerned, well, I think this is one of the best exhibitions I've ever seen. And I would like to thank uh, Marie-Ange Labruyère, who is also blushing in uh, the darkness of this room. Uh, I think it's one of the best realizations, one of the best accomplishments, because uh, we can understand that we won't play uh, the scientific game, you know, so we don't, don't want to, to do as if we were scientists. So there is a, a real scientific work, uh, documentary work, that has been uh, carried out. We are able to discover a certain number of things that um, are not accessible to uh, common people. And uh, we have more than 1,500, 1,600 people per day who visit the exhibition. Uh, but, um, well, but there's, of course, the transmission, the, this uh, research dimension. Um, I think there's also some aesthetic satisfaction and certainly a generation of emotions. And that's where I can say, OK, well, we got to uh, our goal. We managed to reach our goal. The Centre Pompidou also decided to create a uh, hub with uh, businesses. So we tried to work on a certain number of common topics. Uh, emotions are important because emotions are important for businesses too in their relation with uh, customers and uh, even within uh, the company. We send artists in uh, residence so that they may work on emotions within the uh, professional context, and then we make a comparison between our works and the works um, created in the company or in the business. So this is a common preoccupation, actually, amongst uh, several stakeholders. So that's the way we can really build a bridge between art, sciences, and technologies. And uh, historically speaking, so this goes back to the creation of IRCAM because the ERCAM at the beginning uh, was aiming at uh, letting composers and uh, researchers work together and try to uh, make some artistic production. Um, I think uh, there is also scientific production. Uh, it's not simply putting uh, people together, putting uh, or giving uh, tools, technological tools to researchers. No, we also need to uh, foster scientific progress. Then, uh, when we decided to uh, start working with the START uh, project, Science, Technologies, and Art, so this is a European-wide uh, scheme. So that was, uh, for me, an opportunity to go further as far as the volume and dimension was concerned. So the START program, START scheme, uh, is uh, made up of uh, seven partners in five different countries. And this um, has been quite successful because 
uh, scientists uh, have a look at the artistic way and they can also get some inspiration, some criticism, also positive criticism, of course, uh, from artists. Artists may also disseminate information at the same time, also give some feedback on the uh, scientific aspect of things. And that's uh, how we can really build that bridge between arts and sciences. And this is, of course, I think, in relation with uh, the title of this uh, um, of this uh, um, evening. So we have uh, disruptions, fertile disruptions, and uh, fertile. So while well, because we know that so we we don't like ruptures, of course, especially in the economical field, but. Um, uh, fertile, so we can <coughs> actually put art and science together and get something useful out of it. <coughs> this forum and the exhibition are aiming at uh, analyzing this cognitive dimension, and I'm very grateful to those people who uh, have been there, who have supported us. And I'm very pleased also to see that we can really uh, manage um, businesses uh, like uh, Schindler, Bosch, and so on, uh, scientific, scientists and artists, and uh, let them work together. So I would like to welcome you to the uh, Centre Pompidou. So thank you very much. Monsieur le Président, merci. Um, Mr. Chairman, so thank you very much for this introduction. And I think that uh, he managed to summarize what we were really thinking about. But I would like to go deeper into the details of a certain number of aspects. So first of all, so regarding this uh, title, uh, this is a book actually that I wrote a few years ago. Um, so I will switch to English uh, as we have uh, distinguished guests coming from different places of Europe. Uh, I think you have a translation, uh, simultaneous translation right now, so it should be okay. I might also s come with some words in, in French. Uh, <clears throat> so I think what has been underlined right now is that it's not just an event uh, tonight. It's really a major, a fundamental evolution. You have heard there's this exhibition here, but it's not just an exhibition, it's a cycle of, of activities. Um, it's also a major European program uh, with starts. It's pragmatic output with 45 residency going on right now. And we have also some of the key actors uh, moving this path right now with us. So I will start with them to present our guests and let them just provide us some few words about their activity. I will start with the analytic uh, Sibrandi. So you're the founder of the Verbier Art Summit. It's the third edition that happened this year. Um, you're not coming from the art field, but you really get into it and re get with, with passion and re bring very impressive people, uh, prestigious uh, curator, artists, Olaf Eliasson, and many other people, but also young artists. And I think what is very interesting is how you bring people together. I will ask perhaps our team to launch a first film, so we'll have just a snapshot. It was not this year edition, it was the year before, and you really addressed some question with the technology. So let's look at the summit. I think we're at the dawn of a new age in human history. Technology will change art in the most fundamental way. I think VR is probably the hottest medium there is. Because it absorbs you totally. Completely. There, there's, yeah. no, there's nothing else you can do. I think that technology is benefiting so much from the fact that artists are interested in technology and are trying to experiment with it. Do I actually acknowledge that with sensing the world comes a degree of responsibility? So culture is currently the most stable and trustworthy sector in our society. It's incredible. Using robots to study ourselves has not made us robots. I think it has made us more human.
I think the Verbier Art Summit is one of uh, those rare moments when one can have conversations across uh, disciplines. And it's nice to talk to people, interesting to talk to people who really know something, but who also step outside of their special field. The main idea so far is that the more diversity, not just in the environment we live in, but also in the environment that lives within us, the better. Art, I think, has proven again and again that we should not underestimate the boundaries of what is a space or what defines a space, especially when it comes to collectivity and shared experiences. And biofiction for me means that which fuses the writing of life with the study of life, which also now includes an embrace of non-human persons. It's really interesting to see what the different priorities are with everyone involved. The technology constantly seeks to be lost. The pavilion reveals, I think, a fundamental anxiety about the loss of the subject position of us in the global network. I mean, we are living in a very technologically altered landscapes. We're surrounded by artificial synthetic things that we maybe don't think so much about. And, and what will happen to art in this field? We see it coming and there are constantly new conversations about new technologies and sometimes it's maybe exaggerated, but sometimes they really happen. And uh, art was changed by photography and it was changed by film and it was changed by the internet and by television. There's certainly something coming now and we don't know exactly what this will look like. So Anlike, please take a mic. <laughs> um, I think one, it's one thing which is really crucial at this uh, Verbier Art Summit, to introduce it a bit perhaps better, is that you cannot stay, come there and be passive. You need to engage with the other people. You almost force even the shy people to engage. Can you tell us a bit more about the organization and how you bring people together? Yep. So at the Verbier Art Summit, we really want to create a different feeling from when you come to an ordinary art conference. First of all, you need to travel a lot to get there. And even the journey up the mountain inspires you and brings you in a different mindset. Um, and then we keep you there for three days, or at least two. And we produce a talks program whereby we mix artists with other speakers, professors, uh, other academics, philosophers, experts in their field, to provide you with inspiration. And then the next day, we'll have private debates in small groups of 25 people where you're in somebody's chalet. So again, very different format. You're looking at the snow outside, the fire is on, you're sitting next to the museum director of Tate. On your other hand, there might be an interesting artist. And you really talk about the cultural value of art. So it's completely non-transactional. We don't talk about commerce. It's just culture and how can art have an impact on our daily lives. So Silvio Napoli, so first uh, you're the chairman of the board of the Schindler uh, Group. Uh, thank you for to be with us. I know that it was kind of tough journey. You had the general assembly yesterday. You move especially with us today. If you're here, it's not because you have a prestigious function. It's also because first you have an engineering background, coming the real hard engineering uh, core, but you have also a personal journey. I remember in a talk that I listened from you, you moved to India, you had incredible challenge, a new culture, new environment. So basically your, your personal journey is not focused only on the technical performance. Yes, Nicolas, thank you. I would like first to thank um, the Centre Pompidou and IRCAM for organizing this conference. And yes, it is uh, humbling for Schindler to be here today. Um, more than my personal journey, which indeed has taken me around the world, I spent uh, more half of my life across Asia. Uh, this um, uh, opportunity to speak about industry combined with art, I think is something I value enormously. Uh, perhaps the question one is asking, what is Schindler doing here? Uh, you know, there's hardly anything less artistic today than one could think of as an elevator. People even think of the elevator music as the most boring in the world, by the way, it's true. But I think, uh, of course, someone like me who invested 25 years of his career in this can see that elevators actually are the backbone of a building, and building talks about architecture, 
and if you look, for example, at the elevators that were in the uh, 1920s or uh, beginning of the 20th century in New York, Chrysler Building and Chrysler Building, they, that was really art. And in a city like Paris, Berlin, some elevator pieces are really pieces of art. And so we are very proud to be associated with Starts because this then brings us back into uh, this circle which really combines art and technology. And today, going back to the speech made before by the president, technology not only disrupts but also opens new doors because today you can connect all the elevators to the cloud, and therefore, instead of only transporting people, which is actually quite important for social values, just to give you an idea, Schindler transports every day one billion people. One billion people every day take our products. Uh, and if you compare to, you know, Charles de Gaulle Airport, it's about 100,000. Beijing Metro, one million. Indian Railway, uh, probably 50 million, uh, depending which city you are. So, but it's really colossal. So if you can connect all these people to the cloud, you can interact with them, you can create a user experience, which then opens the door to uh, an art experience, sensorial, visual, all different places. So that's why I'm, again, very grateful and I'd like to congratulate Starts for, for what they do. I look forward to this debate today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lisa Preziosa. Uh, so you're coming from another company, uh, Robert Bosch. Uh, during your master's degree, you were working more on the communication side, and then you move into innovation management. So tell us a bit more about what's happening in, in your company, because you're a strong involvement uh, of Bosch uh, in this art field. Right. We are already um, pretty involved with arts and science. Um, and I did a really Boschy thing. I brought some slides. <laughs> Um, so, and I have made the experience that do, doing our project, it takes a lot of time and effort to explain what we are doing. So I'm taking the next minutes to um, try to convey the message to you what we're really into right now. So from, if you don't know Bosch uh, yet, I'll just briefly explain what we're doing. If you know Bosch, you probably know it from like household products like uh, fridges and washing machines, stuff like that. But we're also in the energy and building technology. We're pretty involved also in industrial technology. But actually our biggest sector is mobility solutions, just to give you um, like the background of our company. And three years ago, we moved our whole research department into one campus. Um, researchers of Bosch were spread all around the Stuttgart area. Um, and three years ago, they decided to build a campus. So I'm, I'm, I'm in part of this innovation management of the research campus. And here I brought a slide showing um, what is the background of this campus? Because we will be looking at um, the innovation process and deciding um, what phases are important in, in an innovation process and what needs do our researchers have in each phase. So like in the early beginning, there would be the need for creativity more than in later stages. And also communication would be something that's of important throughout the whole process. Um, but then later on, there would be a need for concentration. You want to work on your idea more closely with um, your colleagues um, or somebody else. Um, but I'm luckily in charge of this really early phase. Um, we are trying to support it um, by providing a creativity room. Um, so this is um, part of this really early phase of innovation to support visualizing your first ideas, rough drafts, um, and so on. And to give you an idea of what it looks like, I brought a short video. There's no sound, um, but you notice here, this is our um, campus. It's located right next to a forest, pretty off um, from, from the Stuttgart area. And here on the 12th floor, so really the upper floor, this is where our creativity zone is located. It's, the whole floor is dedicated to creativity. And here you get a little impression on what it looks like. All our furniture is on wheels. Um, it can be shifted around, can be moved around. It's flexible. And what's really unique about it is that uh, you cannot book it. So anybody can come anytime. There's no reservation up front, which is pretty unique for a company. You probably uh, can um, adapt to that. So, um, but we wanted to do more than just provide a fancy looking room, just like Google or Facebook. Um, we did this really experimental thing, I would like to say, um, to invite artists into our company for three months in a row. So we offered this fellowship in cooperation with Academie Schloss Solitude and an artist duo from Berlin. And the Academy has uh, lots of experience in uh, providing residencies for artists. 
and they help us um, uh, get the call out, um, also do the selection of the artist. And they're there um, with us for three months. Here I can show you um, an overview of all these 15 artists that have been with us since um, October 2015. I've been with all of them, uh, so I've met quite different characters of different backgrounds, different nationalities. Um, and I guess later on I have the chance to go into more detail uh, about what is happening when an artist comes to Bosch. Thank you very much. Next to you, we have uh, Pierre Magistretti. Uh, so you're a neuroscientist. What a neuroscientist is here with us. So first, perhaps to summarize, many years ago, I visited your lab. I made an interview of you, and you were just so focused on the glial cells. Show me how the energy or communicate to the neurons. You were really hardcore, pure science. And then you started, without losing your scientific side, to work with a psychiatrist. And you started to look and discover major things about the plasticity of the brain to see how psychological side were influencing the brain and vice versa. And you, try, you, you really improve a lot the kind of co-creation between the human social side and the uh, physiological side. So can you tell us a bit more about how did this journey started? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Nicola. Indeed, we go back a long time when uh, I was um, uh, in the medical school in Lausanne and then at EPFL. Um, it's true. Uh, I, I come in my career as a, I like to say a mechanic of the brain. You know, I look at the pieces in the brain, uh, but uh, and and that's indeed takes a lot of attention and uh, energy. But somehow I I really had. Um, uh, because of many, uh, like for every one of us, experiences in the life, the environment. I come from um, a, a family of architects and who were creators, uh, and uh, we had often debates about, you know, pure science and creativity. So the issue of creativity is always something, something that uh, was uh, at the heart of my. Uh, yeah, I was always thinking about this, despite the fact of my life as a mechanic. And then, uh, as you point out, I had uh, a very fantastic collaboration with François Sermet, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And, uh, and, we, and then, in this exchange, I, I, I realized how, and, and we worked on this notion of uh, the unconscious, uh, how this is actually, there is a neurobiology of the unconscious, how this is created through plasticity, how this makes us what we are and surprises us, fortunately. If we were just a pure, let's call it rationality, I think the world would be extremely dull. And fortunately, we have 80% of probably what goes on in our brain we don't know. I like so much the sentence of this famous cyclist, uh, Vironque, à l'insu de mon plein gré. And I think we live à l'insu de notre plein gré, uh, much more than we like to think. And I think it's that part that fascinates me. And, uh, and I think that's the part that connects, for me, my scientific field with, with art, with creativity. And, and then I moved further, I, I was involved with Francois in the foundation, and maybe I can talk about it later. But this is how I, I put the two together. Hmm. So, so just to complete your uh, portfolio, you're also a professor at the Collège de France, at the University of Lausanne, at EPFL, KAUST, and you're also the president of the International Brain Research Organization. Uh, so it's quite a lot of work <laughs> to, <laughs> to do. Um, so Ralf, Doom, if we're here today, it's thanks to you. And because without you, starts wouldn't exist like it is. So first, thank you very much. Uh, but so you're coming from the scientific side too. Uh, you're an astrophysicist, if I'm correct. Quantum physics. quantum physics is even worse. And I always admit quantum physics. I never understood it. <laughs> uh, but so how, how did you get involved into art and changing your perception perhaps of the pure astrophysics point of view and, and launching such a, a big program? Well, I've been always interested in, in art. So as a physicist, being interested in art sort of, um, you might argue, was a natural way towards starts. But the reality is it was a bit more complicated. And uh, the, the notion of what, uh, what I consider to be starts and what we now do in the commission regarding starts changed perhaps a bit over, over time. 
initially the idea was really to bring together artists and scientists as a means to, to convey scientific knowledge. Uh, I've been working on modeling of cl climate modeling, behavioral modeling, mobility modeling, uh, in, in the sense of bringing these models into policy. And, and I was, as a scientist, a bit frustrated that these models had so little impact on policy and on society. And, uh, and, and I started to ask, why is that so? And, and, and one of the answers I, try, I was giving is that uh, what science lacks is the narratives, the capacity to tell stories. And this is where artists could come in. So uh, the use of, of art in order to change our behavior and to change our understanding of what we have to do. Um, so, so this was the initial idea of STARTS, but then it evolved a bit more because I'm working in a technology directorate into the idea that the arts are a companion of technology in many ways because technology in the 21st century is no longer technology it was in the 20th century. Uh, technology is, is the iPhone, for example. The iPhone is the creation of experiences. Artists create experiences. Artists think about the impact of technology. And, and in this respect, we, we started to think more about art as, 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 as part of an innovation cycle. And, and this is sort of what became STARTS primarily in, in, in the last couple of years. Um, STARTS evolved conceptually, but also STARTS evolved in terms of what we do and what we fund. For example, the STARTS residences, which are now, I think, one of the most successful parts of STARTS, were initially not really on the radar. So they evolved over time, and we thought this could be the best way to bring art and technology together, bringing artists into technology institutions. Um, we had initially the STARTS Prize, which is very successful. It's an annual prize which is given uh, by the Commission to successful collaborations between art and, and, and technology. Uh, and then we had other activities, perhaps we come back to that later, but, but so to speak, the, the, the cornerstones currently are STARTS Prize and, uh, and, and starts residences. And I think both of them uh, are a means of, of, uh, of, of convincing both the art world and the technology world that working together makes sense. Perhaps we should talk later about more details. Uh, so I will jump in the, in the, the following sections. Uh, I will just make a short summary of where we stand with the starts residency. We had two days of big event around this. Uh, so first, it's a uh, it's um, support and coordination action. It's uh, action. It's not a specific research. Uh, uh, it really helps to move starts further. Um, it really aims to set artists' uh, residency in scientific environments with the, as you said, with the the goal of innovation. I think this is important to be very clear in this, and it's a uh, re partnership and open new uh, pers to open new perspective, but also not only for the industry, but also for the artists. And I think, as you said, it's really going on both ways. So the four goals to summarize. First, it's action-based. It's 45 residency, and they have been planned over three years, and they are now all on. Uh, some of them are even finished. Second, it's a full methodology to implement and manage this residency. It's also uh, tools, and these tools will be available for third parties, for other institutions, for other industries. And I think, fourth, it's also really important to set some knowledge, what we can learn from this residency, so that we can progress on each of this initiative and expand this kind of, of work. So that was just really to summarize where we stand with this um, residency right now. And uh, I would say what was quite impressive that at the end we had about 99 uh, technological companies who applied to uh, get residency. And um, I think this is a kind of success, uh, so that it's not always the same uh, uh, people who are involved in this um, cycles. The knowledge is also coming out in a, I think, quite interesting way. We'll have probably a major publication this, uh, this summer. Uh, so we'll help re to set this famous methodology to see how we can rebring in an efficient way. When I say efficient, it's also about the creativity, it's not you know, about the return investment the next day, but really to have re-impact on long term and also on the creativity process within the, 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 the company. So perhaps as you mentioned, Starts is 
you have these two flagships, uh, or not flagship, but because that's another term <laughs> for the European Committee, but you have this um, two major points with the SARS prize. You have also the SARS residency, but how you see now the evolution of, of, uh, of, of starts right now, because there's some new things that have been recently launched, new projects. Can you tell us a bit more about where it goes? Because it's quite a what framework. Yeah, as I said, so the activities of STARTS evolved over time and, and, and we started out with the STARTS Prize and STARTS Residences. What we now have as well is so-called STARTS Lighthouse Pilots. And, and here the idea is that we, that we uh, launch research projects, like we launched many research projects in H2020 in the European Commission, but with this twist that in these research projects we, we, we demand that 30% of the funding goes to artists. The hope is by having these research projects with a strong artistic component, uh, the results will be more interesting and more, more, more applicable and more human-centered, as I like to call it, as, as results from standard research projects. So, so this human aspect, this, this human touch of technology, I think is a very important part of the, of the new orientation of, of STARTS. Uh, in particular in the area of artificial intelligence, where you know that uh, the Commission has now a long-term plan of, of, uh, of investment, of heavy investment into AI, into artificial intelligence. And uh, what I always say, we need a European way of doing it. So not the Chinese way, and not the US way, a European way. And this European way should be given by giving artificial intelligence a human dimension. And I guess this is something which we want to push, especially with these lighthouse pilots. Uh, we launched also what we call STARTS Academies. So here the idea is that uh, one problem we still have in Europe is uh, that the digital skills are not as widespread as we would like them to be spread. And that one way of, 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 of teaching the digital is by having engineers and artists team up and together teach young kids and young adults and perhaps even citizens uh, certain digital skills that are as of now, not yet as widespread as they should be. So we try to evolve uh, the, the, the portfolio of things we do with starts. And recently what we did is we, we thought about uh, starts in the context of urban and regional development. Because here we think that by, by having starts centers across Europe in certain areas, in certain cities, we could help in, in regional development by bringing together uh, the artistic component, the creative component, with startups, with innovation hubs. And this is something we would like to push now uh, in the future. So you see there's a certain evolution and uh, we are coming now to the end of the current funding cycle. And in 2021, there will be the next funding cycle for the next seven years. And here I hope that the ideas of starts will result in, in, in a program like the current one, but it will also result in the idea that in that across all activities of the Commission, we think about the art as an important component uh, uh, in, in addressing the issues of innovation and of sustainability. So I've mentioned really the notion of user-centric uh, innovation, how we can consider the user among this technology offer. Uh, Silvio Napoli, how, what has been the, the recent evolution in your company to address, or it's something that was integrated a long time ago, or you see re-evolution in the innovation process right now? No, um, I think the question is really valid. Why is it starting now? I mean, it was mentioned before by the president of the Centre Pompidou. Today, technology is often seen as a disruptor, but I like the way he put it, which is more to see it as, a, uh, as, as actually a catalyst which brings back together things that were separated before. We can come maybe later to the question, why should art and technology be separated? Because they were not in, in history. But today, that's where we are. And um, in our case, this is really this. I mentioned before, we move one billion people per day. Today, this is not only people, it's also data. Today, this data, until the advent of cloud technology, was trapped in every single elevator. There is a computer, which we call a controller, which really captures transportation. So imagine a city. We can tell what time people wake up when they, uh, when they go back, uh, they leave, what time they might take transportation using escalators. This is incredibly valuable. But this data to today can finally be used 
not only by us, but by, by, by the community, by, so, by, by society, which therefore creates double opportunity. One is to enhance urban living, but at the same time, create a better experience for the user. Now, some people might not be very excited to have their brain stimulated in a 12 seconds elevator ride to their home, but today you can put screens in every elevator and actually you could even tailor what comes on the screen, which might be clear blue sky, might be the sea, or it might be advertisement, uh, depending on what people prefer. Uh, for example, interacting with their phone and the, and the elevator. And why should it all be industrial? A lot of it could be simply artistic or simply providing a different experience. There is a choice. So to your question, uh, the difference is that today a whole new area is open. And by the way, one of the problems industry has is where do you put it? Because today we have people that are good at installing elevators, people that are good at maintaining elevators, some at selling them, but people that are expert in understanding what people want to have in an elevator, we don't have. So it also creates new job opportunities, new areas, new challenges, new companies. And so I think it's extremely exciting, much more than, than disrupting and threatening. Of course, it is both. Anik, when we're among artists, collectors, it can be seen as a, as a bubble or a small environment. They're usually not speaking about elevators. <laughs> um, but there's huge challenges. Uh, see, that will really influence the, the, the future. And we see that, for instance, elevators, not only elevators, data, it's mobility, it's, it's many stuff. How could we reconnect perhaps better this world of, I would say small, even if it's big, but this world of art to something that really has more impact or influence the innovation today? Yeah, I'm uh, going to look at my sheet because in the 2018 summit, Daniel Birnbaum quoted Walter Benjamin and said, it's art's task to create a demand which can be fully satisfied only later. And Daniel believed that some artists can be said to anticipate the digital possibilities that are being developed with shot speed today. So, for instance, he was saying, was Salvador Dali already thinking in virtual reality? And in his 2018 keynote speech, as we just heard a little bit, Olafur Eliasson stated that VR is bringing a substantial revolution. He was very skeptical about who would take responsibility for this medium. And he said, I have less confidence in the public sector regulating it. People trust the cultural sector more than they trust politicians. If you look at the EU, it's falling apart. I'm not entirely sure about that, but as we just heard him say, culture is currently the most stable and trustworthy sector of our society. So yes, I think it is important for art to take uh, a role here and not to just let it develop by people that might not be thinking necessarily as an artist does in the future. Pierre, you have an idea how we can bring these people perhaps more together based on, on your experience. In, in the uh, Agalma Foundation, you really bring artists and scientists uh, to, to, to together. Uh, so what be, would be the way on your side, uh, as you don't know really specifically starts, what are the critical points? Well, I, uh, as I said earlier, I think um, the... the issue of creativity is, is at the center of the, I think, the, the dialogue that can exist between science, technology, and, uh, and art. Uh, scientists are, have to be creative. I mean, they don't have to create data, but I mean, they have to be creating, uh, create data, you know, that are not experimentally based, but they have to be creative in that they have to go beyond the, the knowledge. Don't be afraid of the unknown. Artists also move in, in the unknown. They have to create uh, something from from their you know from from nothing or some. It's actually not nothing. It's whatever they have accumulated over time in their brains. Same. So it's a mix, in my view, of being able to um, <clears throat> uh, sit on very strong grounds in terms of knowledge or, or craftsmanship or uh, techno tech 
technique, but at the same time, free yourself from this. You need this, but you have to free yourself to uh, be creative. And I think it's uh, the, the, the process between uh, sci original breakthrough science and art is very similar. Again, it's, uh, for me, it's the key to be able to combine both an accumulation of competences and knowledge and then at some point free yourself from, from them and, and, and create something new. Otherwise, you just repeat what others have done and it's not very exciting, both for the science and for art. In the foundation, what what is really done in there? Yeah, so in the in the Agalma Foundation that we started with François Serme, uh, the idea was to have a a, a place where he, outside, uh, in a way, exactly illustrating this process, uh, bringing people from academia or from uh, uh, art. Uh, so people who are familiar and knowledgeable or competent in there, and bring them for on a dialogue. Uh, in what we used to call, we had uh, most of the activity, we had different activities. One are seminars where we debate, maybe a little bit like, uh, it, which, which are open to the public, small public, but still a public. And, and so it's very interactive. But the other was just to um, discuss with, for example, an artist or a philosopher or a scientist, uh, François Sermet and myself, and we have all these, uh, inter it's not interviews, we used to call them experiments. Uh, they are on YouTube, and essentially we try to, uh, the, the, key, the key theme for us is the, the trace. The traces that you have, again, in, in your brain, uh, based on your experience, and then creating new traces at the synaptic level, so between neurons, but also creating uh, new traces through creativity. And that's a recurring theme that really brought together these two worlds and we're still working on it. Yeah, I'll let you also jump into the, the discussion. Don't hesitate to go around. <laughs> uh, Lisa, we often see that the creative part is the artist. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the creative yeah. part is brought by the artist. Yeah. And the, uh, the scientist is producing the knowledge. And that's one of the gaps that we is clearly identified in the literature of uh, residency is that the scientist, the creative of the scientist must be recognized in this co-creation process between the two. And that also that we can acknowledge that the, the artist can produce also knowledge and not be just there just to bring some, just some creative ideas. So how, how do you deal with this? Or do you separate them, you select creative artists and rational scientists? No, actually, uh, <laughs> what's something that I didn't mention before, our um, fellowship is, th this is the difference to the residencies. We, it's an open call. Um, we don't have a topic, we don't have a preset uh, technology that we put forward to be working on. Um, and so for us as a company, um, our interest is in the process within. So what happens in between those three months? And we were um, more interested in the dialogue and the exchange between researchers and artists. So we are um, not as focused on the end result as probably those residencies are, which is, I don't think, um, I think there's just different approaches on how to um, make arts and science work together. And I think Letting artists come into a research facility is something um, that portrays us as being really open because not anybody can walk in and look what we are researching on. Um, so I think there's a big of a side of trust on our side to give to an artist and, and also he's, for him or her it's possible to take something away um, like I'd say, it's, it's a peek into the future, like where is our future heading? Um, what are the researchers working on right now? And I think from whatever they um, participate in, discussions, um, papers they read, um, material we give to them, um, it's, it's possible for them to take something away from their own artwork that can then later on have an impact on society, for example. So I think this is not our um, focus in this uh, partnership. It's more um, we were looking for those new insights, new methods, uh, different point of views. But I think the artist has a real chance here um, to gather information and, and do something with it later on. Sylvia, you wanted to react? Yes, uh Thank you, Nicola. If I may just uh, maybe provoke here a thought. I, it's interesting to see how this debate is about 
um, how to bring art and technology together. But isn't that in reality a false debate? Isn't that the product of a culture that we developed in the last century? Um, allow me to go back, and yes, I'm Italian, but if you go back to the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci, one of the biggest debates is, was he a scientist or was he a painter or was he an artist? And, but in truth, if you look at history, art and technology were very much combined. Uh, specialization has brought two fantastic developments. At the same time, it has brought this rupture, which I think is very detrimental. It detrimental in education. I, like you, studied engineering. We worked together at school, so we also gone back a long time. But the fact that being at school, I was surrounded by people who had only interest in technology, I felt was a very strong sacrifice to make. And, I, and you can see today, we are in Paris. Allow me here for those who are from here. There are some wonderful examples of art through technology. Uh, the best is the Eiffel Tower. When it was made, it was called La Tour de 300 Mètres. It was supposed to show how technology was re revolutionizing cities. By the way, the, the lift was a key element of that. And we have, no, no, and we have in our office, we have in our office the original drawings signed by Gustave Eiffel, actually. It's a, I, we discovered them almost by accident. But and why was it made? Because metallurgy, what I studied back then, you also did too, allowed suddenly to create stainless steel that could hold structures much more than brick did. So I think it's perfectly worthwhile to think, you know, I think all this project that it started doing is fantastic, but it's almost looking like a band-aid over a fracture. And um, I think questioning this whole point, why should they be separated, I think is a, as an equally worthwhile question. And I wonder whether any of the colleagues here would have anything to say about that. Yes, no, I, I, I fully, I mean, I, in my first um, comments, I, I focused on this notion of creativity because it's something that, you know, it's really, I mean, the brain is, I think, uh, very much involved in creativity, and that's why it's something that, that kind of combines my two interests. But technology and art being much more uh, connected uh, through throughout time, I, I fully agree with you. I mean, we just think you're referring to, uh, to Leonardo, but imagine, uh, I was also struck, uh, Antonello da Messina. He used, a, he learned the oil uh, technique from the, the, the northern Europe, and he is a different uh, paint, Italian painter. Uh, and, and, and that's a technique, it's a technology, uh, and so on and so forth. When, when uh, photography was introduced, that opened a new area of art. When uh, um, the Les Frères Lumière uh, <laughs> introduced, uh, you know, filming, and now and now we are in the digital world. And the digital, what can digital this digital revolution bring to art? I think it's a, and and and, and there will be, and there are already artists using uh, digital technologies, uh, and so you're right. Uh, we, we artificially, or we, because we are forced, we, we navigate in, in different uh, rivers, but hopefully sometimes they can converge. In fact, just, I just have an association. In Lyon, they, there is a museum at the convergence of the Saône and the Rhône, which is somehow thought to be uh, a convergence. Uh, and that's what we could do more. <laughs> But, but if we can, we can even go back to Raymond Lull, who was redoing really the first thinking, uh, uh, the computer, computational thinking in the, the early Middle Age. But then it's kind of a, it's fantastic, but at the same time, it's, it's a big mess. I mean, <laughs> you have scientific part, you have uh, also the uh, mystical part and everything. So it has a richness in terms of creativity. It's open new path. But you, as a boss of a big company, you say, well, I need the things to be fixed and working in time and delay. So how can you match this type of creativity within uh, a big company which has to deliver mobility at, at large? Um, thank you for putting me on the spot. I, 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 <laughs> no, but it, it goes back, let me say, a product can be beautiful and can be effective at the same time. At the same time, if you think now, sorry, very current, overused example, Apple. Apple Steve Jobs, who had many things, probably not so sympathetic as a person, but nonetheless, he had this. Yeah. Products had to be beautiful. Automotive is the same thing. Uh, products that are successful can also be beautiful. Being beautiful alone is not enough. 
And this is perhaps where you get the tension between creativity and engineering. But both combined, it's, it's beauty. It's art in a, probably at a very high level. Uh, so in our company, what we try to do, I mean, design plays a role. And maybe not many people see it, I agree with them, but truly when you are into architecture, when you're into this, you, you, you know, you can tell. And it's very easy to make a cheap thing that goes up and down. When you create an experience, when you create people that feel at home when they enter into a lift to go into a building, that is, that, that is an art. Uh, and, and that's what we try to combine. The challenge is that you can't really measure it. So as a boss, you have to stand for this. You have to say, okay, this works, cost met. Uh, time to market met, but no. People hate you for that, but this is what you, the privilege you get after some years working in the company, <laughs> and I think it's worthwhile. <laughs> Actually, I'd like to uh, react to that. I think, um, especially from my experiences in, on, in this fellowship, um, there's a difference between um, artists helping in shaping a product uh, to make it more user-centered or whatever, because uh, this is also where there's a fine line between a designer and an artist, I think. And also, um, I think with us providing this fellowship, artists um, not come in to improve any products um, at first sight, but I think the real value in, in being an artist is having um, a pretty strong opinion about society, strong opinion about the world or how it should be or how it shouldn't be. And the chance in bringing in an artist in a research facility or any research projects is um, to to make an impact right there where future is being created. So for example, there could be those social implications, it can be ethical implications on AI or topics like that. Um, so for example, one of our artists was um, bringing up the topic of the basic income, for example, which can have implications on our future work ethics. Um, and I think without an artist, um, this topic wouldn't have been uh, brought up within our company. So I think um, there's this difference between like product-centered and also the value of artists um, doing a much yeah, greater work in a, in a, on a higher level, I guess, on a meta um, level. Kind of. And Anli, don't you think that also there's kind of a way for artists to stay in a certain environment because it's a full freedom uh, rather than to be involved uh, without just being uh, or being a designer uh, or product designer, but being involved in the innovation? Uh, how it can perhaps change also this perception of the uh, or bring the artists more to work with the industry in a very open way, uh, by the way? Yeah, I guess... Um, VR is a good example, actually, uh, which is totally a technology. And in the gaming world, uh, there's a lot of experience of using VR. So that is where it's developing. But they're not necessarily thinking about it being a holistic experience or providing any benefits to society, whereas artists would. But it then takes a lot of time for them to learn also to create this technology. So we see artists moving into VR, but actually the gamers are still better at it because they spend more time on it. They work on it on a daily basis. So I think that is definitely a complexity. But, but VR is a good example because you see the last figures, VR is going down uh, quite dramatically because, I mean, on a, except for gamers or a specific professional application, I mean, when you have seen the 3D environment once, it begins to be a bit boring. It's also perhaps not good for the, for the brain because you, you trick the, 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 the brain. Uh, so here, it really comes to the, the, the output of this kind of interaction. Because, okay, we have a nice artifact, we have a nice concept, uh, we can have, a, 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 I don't know, an art piece in the, uh, in, the, in the building. But how we can observe the outcome of this kind of interaction? Uh, without being just about performance of the of the device, how it can we take something out just beyond a generic concept? Uh, I'm not answering the question <laughs> immediately, but actually I, I had exactly the same question for for Lisa. It's really from you describe what what the environment, what the concept that you have in on the twelfth floor of the Bosch building. Um, it's it's really amazing that uh, a company that has to, you know, as I assume shareholders has to uh, produce, uh, you know, um, dividends and so on, um, is 
Well, that's a question. How how is it? How do the management, the top management, sees? And then maybe Sylvia can answer from the top management point of view. Uh, how does it? Uh, first of all, how did they get to create this, and what do they expect? Uh, because uh, it's it's. I think it's quite unusual. Is it? I gather from what I understand is to create kind of a, an, an atmosphere of, of, again, maybe freedom and creativity and, and, and harmony within the company. I don't know. This is, I, I could see it, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so that's why I started out by showing uh, that we created this campus three years ago and our management back then um, was pretty open and, and uh, brave to do a project like this. And um, I'm grateful that they did. Um, so in the beginning, it started out as an experiment, really. So they didn't know what was happening. Maybe Platform 12 would have been closed by the end of the year. Nobody knew. Um, so in the beginning, we didn't even uh, consider going public about anything like this, because anything can really happen when you invite artists, right? Uh, <laughs> so um, like I said, we've been doing this for three years, and uh, the management back then um, was brave enough to say, OK, you, you go for it. Uh, we'll, we'll see what comes out of it. And what our management is actually offering to the researchers is 10% of their time is called concept time. is something they can use for the, anything, really. Um, any innovation activities that are not related to the actual work. So they could use, for example, this 10% of time to work with an artist or to work with other colleagues um, that are not in, in the daily work routine. Um, but of course, I'm also facing these challenges um, in documenting or in um, measuring results. And even then, when we are not focused on product development, I think this is even harder to, to get a feeling for what, what's really the output of this. Um, so what I, what I can see is how the, how the creativity room is being used, how many people go there. Um, I can see how many people are in, involved with the artists over time. And what it does, and I think this is an impact that is hard to measure but easy to feel, is how the culture shifts within the company or within our research facility for, for starters. Um, people are more open to each other. They, they talk to each other within the room without hesitance. They just, whenever it's a management or you wouldn't tell, you wouldn't be able to tell. You just talk to someone. And usually in a working environment would be a little weird to go someone, hey, what are you working on? You know, Nobody does that. But in this creativity room, it, it creates this atmosphere of openness and, and uh, freedom and not being a challenge to, and to answer answer what you have been doing in the past 20 minutes or whatever. So I think this is um, this opportunity we, we got from our management is a, is a brave one to have a cultural shift into a, a more um, valuable or there's this um, um, trust being given to the, to the employees. And this is something that cannot be measured, uh, what comes out of it really. But like I said, it's something that I can feel as an employee working there. Um, it creates a much uh, more productive atmosphere within the colleagues. So here we have two companies that seem to be quite convinced, and even Schindler has a, a residency. Uh, that. And you didn't know this, so there was no influence, there were, nothing was planned. It was recapped secret until uh, today, so that, that's, that's really good. But you have, you have to convince also some politicians to do this. So how does it work? Are you, you, you were able to, do, to convince some of them at least. <laughs> some of them, yes, not all of them, but some of them, yeah. Um, What's the perception um, in this relation? Or I guess policy makers are easily to convince because they understand uh, it is mainly on the level of, of people who are directly running technology problems that you sometimes have the problem of convincing them that such a strange object as an artist should make sense in a technology project. And, and what I normally cite is the iPhone. You see, you cited it as well. I, I call the iPhone some sort of Gesamtkunstwerk, you see which is not only uh, uh, technology, which is not only uh, interfaces, which is not only uh, the software, which is the gesamte, the, which is the, the, the overall holistic experience. And I guess, uh, as, as uh, I guess John Dewey called it, art is experience and technology is experience, and, and these two can work together. Um, uh, of course, uh, as I said, my, my initial ideas about starts were more in, in, in the direction of 
of co-creation, which is something we saw a lot of examples of this in the Stats residences. So co-creation, engagement of people. And this is also something which we see in the social media. And, and here, I guess, we have projects in particular in the area of social media and what we call collective awareness platforms, where artists play a role in, in, in being catalysts of these of this participatory approaches. And here again, I guess everybody agrees. You see, where people have a tendency to disagree is when it comes to standard technology. Uh, but I guess this is these two aspects which uh, I guess by and large we, we, we advance in a direction where everybody understands that, uh, that the role of art is, is, is to, to help think out of the box, right? to, to ask questions. Well, asking questions, it's also the role perhaps of, of artists to bring uh, feedback in a critical way uh, because we had also an innovation with the uh, the um, Google Glass or the TV 3D, a lot of failures that mm -hmm. cost a lot to, to the company. Wouldn't be also interesting to involve artists to have this critical point of view uh, in the early stage? Certainly it will be. And um, combining this question with the one asked before by Pierre, um, what really can artists, I believe, bring more? I mean, um, at least I mentioned culture. There is one culture that needs to be broken I really believe, to foster innovation, creativity, and that is the fear to fail. And fear to fail, I love to hear <laughs> psychologically, is deeply embedded in our, in our education culture, in the way companies are run, and uh, it is critical um, to challenge that as a leader. The question was, asked, what can we do in a company? Uh, we are not at the level of Bosch, uh, can have, we, we can't afford to have a floor like this, but the idea to do as leaders, to constantly challenge this culture, fear to fail, to tell people, not it's just okay just to fail, but you know, it's okay to fail if you tried. The, to, um, people leaving, Google claims that they celebrate failures. I, I, I've never seen it, but at least they do. Um, they say that. Uh, but in a company, they to, you try something new. If it's well done, even if it doesn't work, it's going to help for the next development. That is a deeply, I believe, artistic approach, uh, which also creates a lot of soul searching, which traditionally companies are not prepared to do. So as a leader, what can you do is to stimulate that. And I, and I think this then takes you to new levels, uh, which I believe are, um, are extremely in tune with this idea to bring back an artist, or at least an artist way of thinking into the way things are developed, even in an industrial environment. A, a friend of mine, uh, he's a venture capitalist, he, he, he's, he told me once, um, America, you call it venture capital. In, in France, you call it capital risque. So it's already in the language that you see the difference in, in approach. Briefly, they even told me why is it true that, uh, for example, Germany uh, or, or, or very strong development or Northern Europe, why we fail completely in digital, in phones, because we have this mentality, do we try it the first time? Which is true. This is the way that, it's even, by the way, one of our, of our core values. But then if you want to be able to create fast, you should also be able to accept, no, maybe the first time doesn't work, but I'll, I'll try again and again and again. So I think the example is good, sorry. Uh, in the academic um, environment, bringing uh, an artist in a lab, actually uh, I was involved uh, with the University of the Arts in Zurich with uh, Irene Hediger. Uh, we had at the Brain Mind Institute at EPFL for I think three, four years, artists in residence in the Brain Mind Institute. And uh, what artists brought were questions. Uh, okay, why do you do this like this? Why do you have to? I mean, uh, it, it may sound a bit, uh, you know, superficial, but actually, you know, very simple questions and make the scientists think, yes, why do we do it like this? I, I don't say that it revolutionizes science, but it keep, you know, scientists, despite all the maybe the, 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 the myth, you know, that they are uh, cr innovative and creative. A lot of scientists are conservative uh, because you have the pressure to publish in the best journals, you get your grants, so you do things. Uh, maybe it's not, maybe, uh, maybe there are similarities with, with, uh, with corporate world. You, know, you have to avoid the failure also. And so uh, I think to, to, to bring some, some, some questions in what you do uh, keeps your um, mind open for risk. 
in the art, isn't that also the case in the arts? Uh, sometimes where artists find a good solution, he produces more about this. Is it also the same kind of mechanism then? Yeah, at the Verbia Art Summit, we keep saying ask questions, uh, not ask the right questions, but just ask questions, which is exactly what artists are doing all the time. And they give you a new perspective. They look at things in a different way, and they open your mind to also look at it their way. And that is, I think, where art has a crucial role to play. So <coughs> while they're looking for a question, just no, one more remark on, on, on this relation. Uh, we, we, had two we have these starts prizes every year, mm -hmm. and, and last year we had the starts prize of, of an architect trying to create out of gravel stable structures. And, and it's interesting, the story he told, he was talking to the engineers, it's at Zurich, it happened in Zurich at ATH. Um, so he had this idea of creating these stable structures out of gravel, and he go, went to the engineers, and the engineers said, this will never work. A and then he was stubborn enough to come back to them, and at some stage the engineers started to think, and now the start price shows very well. They create now with, with robots and with very special uh, uh, concepts, uh, stable structures out of gravel, but this would never have happened if the, the artist wouldn't have been stubborn enough to insist, you see. And I guess this is a very nice example what starts could do. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yes, I have a... Can you please, yeah, where, yeah, just Yes, uh, Greg Belair from um, uh, coordinating art science uh, project at IRCAM and also in the, uh, in the starts project. Um, I just would like to make uh, to maybe open uh, a question or a, a theme on uh, creating human relationships uh, because we talk about nice examples of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, of people who, who were who were one, the artist and, and the same, the, 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 the let's say the creator with a, b a big C. Um, we all have these um, um, twofold sensibilities and um, uh, be playing with techniques and also uh, having some aesthetics point of view. Um, and, but, but in, for instance, with this program, it's all about like making people working together actually. And I wonder whether um, uh, maybe there are some sketch in the, um, the way maybe industry is making people working together sometimes in a short, uh, short amount of time or um, oh, in, within uh, your, f your framework, uh, maybe in Bosch you were talking about three months. Also research is about a long time period, sometimes creation must be a burst of actions. Um, so, yes, my, my, I guess it's an um, open question, actually, <laughs> uh, on the oh, oh, can we make people together, I mean. Yeah, I think, that, that, yeah, this is a, a critical question, I think, because often when it's about science or technology, you have two to three years, four years, and when it's about uh, uh, design, that's what we do in our, in our lab, design research, or it's about uh, art. Uh, it's it's three months, and that's when you ha you are lucky. Um. Uh, thank you for this very important question. Again, um, I can I can definitely ad relate to the importance of this. I can give you an artistic example, but definitely how our um, technology brings together people through creativity can give a very good example. And it goes back to the discussion we had before about separating science and art, in this case, is within a company separating people in functions. Traditional industrial development, the way also we learned at engineering school, is you are specialist in design, specialist in mechanics, specialist in electronics, specialist in manufacturing, and they used to work all separately. And then you get these huge projects with only the manual of the project was taking longer than the whole project itself. Today, fast forward, this doesn't longer work, because by the time you develop a new product like this, uh, someone else would have come with three new products, which are cheaper, and by the time you come out with yours, it's completely outdated. So the modern way of developing, and maybe some of you know it already, is called literally scrummaging. La mêlée, comme en France, on fait la mêlée. So you bring people all together, and they were, depending on which industry you're in or work, they are in the same room, and sometimes 
that's where technology plays a role as well, because you have video conferencing, immediate interacting, um, and then they develop and they have to deliver results together with rhythm of a month or very often a week, which then creates a whole different dynamic, which is similar to the one Lisa referred to, that people suddenly there's no much much less silos, much less rivalry, and the way also the brain interacts, it's much faster, a lot less of those defensive mechanism, us versus them happen. And so this whole human interaction, human element, comes back into the creativity, in this case, of industrial products. But I'm sure it would be the same uh, in art. That's our example. Um, from my experience, um, this human side uh, was actually lacking right now in this conversation earlier. I think it's really important if, if you like someone, if, if you feel like this person has the same hobbies or I don't know, it just is uh, sympathetic, um, you, you connect really easy to them. And then I think it's much easier to find common ground even in your um, research work. Um, so what I've experienced, the, the pairs that I've uh, matched um, in the past, they worked the best um, when they liked each other right up front, and it was, um, my job is to, to make these matches to, to the artist comes in and I'll, I'll go um, looking at his biography and say, okay, you'd be interested in this and this topic within our research facility. And then I try to um, manage to, that the research and the artist have coffee together or go to lunch. And then I don't put pressure on it at any time. I'll just see if they get along. And I think this human connection right there in the beginning is really important. And then you find in, in the beginning, they would say the researcher would, would say, um, I don't have time for this. You know, um, I have my daily work to, to be focusing on. And once they get to know each other and they think there's a real sympathy there, they find the time. And I think this is really key in, in this um, intersection of art and science to not forget the, the human side of it as well. Other question in the audience? Um, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Rachel. I'm a project manager in the research department at the v a in London. Um, and we work with a lot of artists and academics and curators within the museum. And I suppose the, a lot of project management methodologies sort of privilege the, the outcome or the deliverable, what's at the end of the project. And I, I just wanted to know from each of you how much, uh, how much value you place on the outcome of, of your um, collaborations um, and residencies. Um, and, and if you believe, as I do, that there's as much value in, in the process and of, of collaborating, how might you convince others that that is also as valuable as what, what you end up with at the end? Yeah, I think, for example, with the Verbier Art Summit, this is something we're also still developing. Uh, and I thought it was interesting how you now mentioned with STARTS that you're very happy that you produce a publication. Uh, to document what you've been doing, and this is what we also do. So after each summit, we launch a publication with all the input from the speakers. Um, so at least people that weren't there can still benefit from what was being discussed. But I think this is a very interesting topic that, uh, that requires a lot of further research for us as well. Well, addressing the second point of your question, how do you convince... Uh, uh, I have to say that uh, I've done a couple in a couple of environments, academic environments, uh, this kind of matching or bringing in artists in uh, in lab, and um, uh, it's not so difficult. At the end, people find why not, uh, and they're maybe a bit hesitant at the beginning, but eventually uh, the chemistry works. And I think a very important point, and I think what you mentioned, you. Uh, I don't know exactly what you do, but you, you match, you, you have some <laughs> talent for this, I imagine, exactly. That's very important. So I think it's something that has to be uh, conducted by, by people who know what they're doing, professionals in this, in this field. Because the idea is nice, of course. So yeah, and, and as I said, the first idea comes through nicely, the first reaction in general, in my experience. But then you, you need to, to manage. It's, it, it's, a, it's a profession to make things, this thing work. 
Um, well, I'm not sure if I'm really qualified to do this yeah. matchmaking, <laughs> but um, I think what's important is that you have a feeling for humans. You, you can read a little bit their faces. Is, are they feeling comfortable? Uh, is this putting too much pressure on someone? And I think um, I've been doing a okay job in uh, kind of doing that for the last um, times. But um, answering your question as well is um, we asked uh, our artists to do a final presentation at the end of these three months and I think this is really important because sometimes only like two or three um, employees um, would have had the chance to work closely with one artist and I want to give something back to our whole campus you know not everybody had the chance to meet or they were not connecting as well so uh, in these final presentations from our side it, it doesn't have to be like a final product not a final movie not anything what I'm interested is in is to, to get the reflection what was the opinion of the artist um, working in a research facility like what has he what, what were the experiences um, and that can be really open and really um, harsh maybe to hear that um, we are uh, slow, we are boring, or I don't know. Uh, it's, it's just really important to hear that from an outsider sometimes. And um, so this is what we ask. We have these final presentations for the whole campus. Um, people come and visit and talk afterwards, which is really nice. And what we try to um, document as well um, for the last, I don't know, eight artists, we've um, tried to document it in a movie. It's really short and it's, um, I guess, for PR purposes for our side, but also for the artists and also our partners. So everybody can use it to sh showcase what has been happening in these three months. So if you're interested, I guess you can Google Platform 12 and Bosch. Um, they're all on Vimeo. So we have several videos uploaded there. I hope this can be something that can be used to convince other people that there's a, a real potential and benefit to it. I think y your question is, is really interesting because it sort of address the issue of definitions. Uh, what is really the output uh, and what is the process? I mean, some of the, the process could be part of, uh, of the output because you learn by doing stuff and then has a strong value. If it's only considered the output, the increase of performance of a specific, which is not by, bad, by the way, but uh, then it really limits what is the output, what we can uh, uh, measure. Um, so I will, we're uh, almost at the end of our debate. I will just go around a last time and ask you if you had to think or come back here in 10 years, uh, because HALF will continue to work a lot, so improve starts. What would you say that would be a great success or incredible achievement of this of this program, this European program, not only for Ralph itself, but <laughs> but at, at large for the uh, for Europe and and the uh, industry and the artistic community? What could this kind of a program really achieve or bring at large uh, as a program? To create more Da Vinci's. <laughs> <laughs> A few books or articles written by an artist and a scientist. That we will all have become makers. To have more different ways of art enabled by technology. There are already examples coming. So the Google already has a virtual reality uh, sculpture program called, I think it's called Twist. Uh, David Hockney today paints most of his work on an iPad. There are a lot in 10 years to see what else is going to come up. And I think uh, that when I have ex exhibition at the Centre Pompidou or a major museum of, uh, of te new technology art. So uh, for what would be your expectation, your, your dream? Uh, well, you uh, have a bit more time to tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember uh, I don't know, 30 years ago, we, there was um, in Austria the the founder of the Green Party was asked exactly the same question. So what would you consider the big success of the Green Party? And his answer was, uh, if we are no longer needed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for starts, it's approximately the same. You see, if, if the mindset changes and if people understand that working of technology and art is, is a normal thing, like it was under Leonardo da Vinci's time, right? Then I guess the success of starts would be indeed it's no longer needed, right, in, in some sense, right, so that the mindset spreads. Okay, so thank you very much for coming here, and hopefully we'll continue to communicate on the outcome of Start Presidency. I think 
it's also possible to see the different work that you're doing. The Art Summit will continue next year. What will be the topic? Can you already? It's secret. Uh, it's secret. So, but so watch on the on the website. Hopefully, there will be some link also with the with technology or, or science. It should be. Uh, we can see some on the website some of the residency outcome at, at Bosch. It's open or it's closed. Um, no, it's open, and anybody can work. Once we've released them, they're uh, open to the public. <laughs> some, some new project from the uh, uh, Agalma Foundation? Uh. Um, yes, I mean, it would be, uh, as we uh, dig more into this uh, connection between unconscious uh, um, um, processes and creativity. I mean, this is really an object that we are discussing and which really, as I mentioned earlier, I think brings together science and, and, and art. And we'll see probably in, in about one year, we'll see also the residency with, the, uh, with your company, with Schindler, see what is coming out, so that will be something also new uh, and we'll be looking forward. Thank you very much again and uh, have a happy evening. Don't forget to visit the exhibition upstairs I think it's really worth it. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to see a strong link also in the history between uh, science and uh, art because for sure it has started a long time ago, as we said. So it's a good way to witness this evolution. Also to thank uh, all the people of IRCAM uh, who organize, and, and Centre Pompidou who organized uh, this, this event, Hugues Vinet, um, who is, was really instrumental in, in this. We have also uh, Sylvie Benoit, Louise Angelbert, and all the people from the Technique and the translator here who did a strong effort to make this possible. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>